Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the 2021 ACC. I would like to thank George and Christy and all of the organizers for inviting me to give this plenary talk. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is lessons from adaptive control and how we can use them and move towards real-time machine learning. Um, and what I'd like to share with you has been produced primarily by my former students, students, collaborators, and I would like to acknowledge in particular Joey, Jose, Arnab, Anubhav, and Ingnan, who are my former and current students and my long-term collaborators, Mike Blender and uh, Eugene Lavratsky. Now, not just in the kinds of um, specific applications that I will focus on, which uh, to, to a certain extent is from uh, flight control, um, whether it is in air or ground transportation, whether it's energy or whether it's manufacturing or robotics or healthcare, on Mars, we are really moving from traditional systems to smart systems in that we can first collect data about these uh, uh, systems by having a pair of eyes, which gives us not only just course information about the system that we are tr uh, trying to address and understand, but using heterogeneous sensors, very fine sensors distributed in space and in time, so that we have visibility and we have situational awareness, we have eyes on the field. Now, in, ad in addition to these eyes, then we can take this information and then convert them into actions. And so we have arms, we have self-governing features, we have autonomous features that allow these systems to really go from partial autonomy to some fully automated ones. And of course, in addition to these eyes and arms, we really need the brains, which basically is what we do, control. And the control uh, methodologies too, over the past few decades have become more sophisticated uh, from linear to single input, single output to central and centralized to nonlinear adaptive and distributed. And all of these things are really taking us towards this highly desirable autonomous system of systems that are able to self-govern, so that, that adapt themselves, that are evolutionary. And so question is, how do you realize this holy grail? and how you uh, can make this uh, happen uh, for, a, for a large scale system, for a complex system, uh, for, for, for a system that really is subject to enormous uncertainties um, in the environment that cannot be anticipated, which means that we really need a way of making real time decisions and control. And so uh, this question becomes even more compelling when you focus on systems that are safety critical. So again, let me focus my attention on transportation. So the typically the kind of metrics that transportation systems have to meet is that the penalty needs to be no fewer than seven deaths for every 10 to, 10 to the nine miles. And this number becomes even more stringent as you go, go towards mass transit. In trains, it's 0.4 and ships and airplanes, it's basically becomes even smaller. So given that you've got uh, this extraordinary uh, constraints, and so the traditional approach basically is very systematic and elaborate and has been designed very, very carefully using a variety of engineering tools. And so if you were to just basically start from a system analysis, you take it apart and given, given that being a large scale system, you're going to have from a, a variety of components, you then basically categorize it according to what exactly is the penalty if any one of these things fail. And depending upon the kinds of uh, failures that, that you can withstand, then you know you categorize them. And then you do this by basically taking every component of every system and essentially exploring um, uh, across the board as to what all the different combinations in which this, these things can fail. Now, um, when, you, when it comes to analysis, um, in addition to this uh, extensive empirical testing, what we are in the business of doing here as a group is basically to focus on ways in which we can analyze these things, we can design these things using model-based methods, using formal methods, and, and all of these things are things that we've been doing over the past several decades. And now, in addition to all of this, the moment you make the problem autonomous, these metrics become even more stringent. So it's not enough if you have the, meet the same kinds of numbers that we talked about last time, in the last slide, but it actually becomes even more critical that, so for example, here are all these uh, uh, items that make the news that says that 
um, uh, the scrutiny for how these systems are to be designed and commissioned becomes even higher. And so it's just not enough to meet the same metrics. And so you need to really meet these um, cr uh, criteria where essentially the error is of the order of 10 to the minus eight and even more. So given this formidable task, what I'd like to focus on are ways in which we can combine methodologies from the adaptive control tool set and the machine learning, to the learning tool set. And uh, so my talk will go over these broad strokes where I'd like to first begin with the kinds of components that have been addressed in the context of adaptive systems and how learning basically manifests itself and the fundamental tools that have um, the, provide the substrate for how this learning can be accomplished and what are the cautionary tales and challenges here. And then I'd like to go to machine learning and again, uh, talk about some of the basic tenets that basic, uh, uh, give us the opportunity to move towards real-time decision and control. And again, provide you with some instantiations of how these two can be com combined. So without further ado, let me jump into the first one in here. Uh, now, for those who are experts in the audience on adaptive control, apologies for the redundancies in here. So we're just going to go over basically the fundamental problem statements um, that uh, govern um, the evolution of adaptive control. So we are indeed talking about a dynamic system where parameters are unknown. The uncertainties are assumed to be in the form of parameters. And the question then is, how can we go about designing the control strategies? And so the control uh, uh, goals are very similar in that you want the system to behave in a certain way. And so if indeed, let's say you want to track uh, uh, a desired signal, then the control strategies basically have to do with designing um, a methodology by which you do two things simultaneously. You design the control input that is needed in order to essentially make the system behave in the desired manner, but you also are trying to simultaneously learn the uncertainty. So the learning here basically occurs in the form of parameter learning. And you do all of that using online information. And these uh, uh, control inputs are basically being designed in real time. And so how do you do that? How do you design this box? How do you design the operator C1 and C2? That's the name of the game in here. Now, in order to do that, it turns out that there are basically two kinds of errors that one deals with. One is a performance error where you need to get to, well, the difference between um, what the actual plant state is doing and what your desired state is for the plant or any kind of estimation error. So this can be measured and it needs to be reduced. However, what really is the goal is to learn the parameter, the uncertainties in theta, which is in the form, which is what we call as theta. Now, if I estimate it as theta hat, we have now the second kind of error, which is that you have a parameter error. This is unknown, but it can be adjusted. So how do you adjust the estimate of what you think the parameter is in a way so that your performance error stays uh, small? That's really the name of the goal. And that's what is done in adaptive estimation. And that's what is done in adaptive control as well. So the problem, it becomes very simple if you have a uh, just a static linear regression problem. So let us say, for instance, you have something like an ARMA model. So you've got all of your past inputs and outputs affecting the current output. So then indeed you can represent the combination, the linear combination, which corresponds to the parameters. And remember the name of the game is parameters are unknown. Then you indeed want to build an estimator that gives you a way opportunity for learning this parameter. So let's say you build it using certainty equivalence in this form, then that gives you a performance error and here is your parameter error. In this particular case, the relationship is very, very simple. It's just a linear regression. And therefore indeed you, the relation between the performance error and the parameter error can be cast in this very nice convex form. And so one, uh, process by which you can really determine a recursive parameter estimation is the use of Robbins uh, and Monroe based gradient descent algorithm. And again, there are many other evolutions by which people have uh, proposed and arrived at this uh, solution. Now it turns out that this kind of a gradient rule gives you trouble if you try and transport this to complex dynamic systems. And this was basically the cautionary tale that adaptive control uh, 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 community realized uh, early in the game. And so this is the reason why this gradient descent method, which actually takes this very simple form, really cannot be uh, utilized in general. And that's the reason for introducing a stability framework 
that says that you, instead of looking at this performance error, one really ought to look at the appropriate um, uh, energy-like function and make sure that that energy does not in, uh, increase. And that basically is the fundamental uh, idea where the adaptive control approaches and this gradient-based uh, approaches have, have uh, really departed. Now, when it comes to the chronology of events, this idea of using the gradient descent and using an adaptive approach to real-time online learning and control is actually several decades old. And actually there was a whole bunch of symposia that happened in, in the late 60s that all of which actually has in the, were in the context of like control systems. And so propulsion, aerodynamics and GNC and GNC was basically adaptive control that were proposed as the method by which you realize these self-adaptive systems. And not only was it just a theoretical exercise, uh, of course, there was lots of books that were written and there's actually one even by Bellman way back when on adaptive control. And, and these theoretical methodologies actually were implemented um, in a very extensive flight program, which basically led to a hypersonic uh, 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 program X-15, where there were several successful uh, flights, and this is uh, the MH-96, Minneapolis Honeywell um, uh, adaptive controller. Now, the stability framework basically was most uh, appropriate because this particular X-15 also led with a, a, a tragic accident where there was a mishap and, and they uh, uh, lost an aircraft and the pilot. And that was basically because of the lack of understanding of how these uh, relationship between the learning and control plays itself out. And this led to a whole bunch of, of um, uh, careful thinking at the theoretical level, which now I'm fast forwarding over uh, four decades of work in here, which said that here is a way in which one ought to approach this fine line between how you adjust the parameter estimate so that your performance stays, um, is, is, is guaranteed. And, and the fundamental problem here basically is that this estimation, parameter estimation and control are duals of each other. So strictly speaking, you need infinite time in order to learn the parameters, but infinite time is simply too late when it comes to control. And so how do you basically tread this fine line? And that uh, basically has led to all of the key results in, in ad ad adaptive control. And because the problem basically is that um, the user, when you use real time data, you don't often really get the immediate effect of the parameter adjustment, but you only get it in the form of a performance error. E, e prime is not what you get, but only after certain latencies. And this latency is the one that can cause a stability problem. So what this says is that performance and learning are conflicting objectives. Sometimes you really have to sacrifice performance in order to make sure that you learn. And in a safety critical system, that becomes very challenging as to how much of a performance deterioration are you willing to tolerate? And so in order, so yes, you can learn. And the notion of learning is associated with the notion of persistent excitation, which again is a necessary and sufficient condition for parameters to be learned. However, without this learning, even with imperfect learning, can you guarantee that you have a control performance? And that is, is basically how uh, adaptive control has developed. And for that, a Lyapunov framework and equivalent ones have been used over the, uh, over the past few several uh, decades, like I said before. Again, I'm fast forwarding through many of the key developments, but the key uh, uh, story here is that here is a control structure where the input and output are U and YP, and we measure them and we process them in a particular way. And we adjust the parameters, the theta one, theta two, et cetera, are the ones that are trying to uh, learn the control parameter that you are to put in. And uh, by adjusting it according to the rule that is specified in here, um, you can uh, realize the goal. And it becomes very simple when the latencies are low, when the relative degree, the net order is one, but then it is higher, it becomes a little bit more complex, but nevertheless, there are algorithms that can be designed that tell you how these uh, controllers, which are the operators W1, W2, et cetera, can be designed. And uh, uh, what, everything that I talked about was obviously in the context of uh, linear systems. And so when you take this towards nonlinear systems and, um, uh, uh, you know, add disturbances and, and, and model dynamics, one not only needs to make sure that things are stable, but also uh, robust to, to these different methods. And so here, um, the, the, the key result is that um, 
when you have a, uh, let's say a transfer function WP and you have parametric uncertainties associated with this uh, 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 model. And these are things that you know are indeed uh, limited to parametric uncertainties. Now, what if there are all kinds of other deviations or disturbances that are parameters are actually changing with time that are time delays. And uh, this could be either because there are delays because of the processing or simply that there are unmodeled dynamics that you could not take into account for the adaptation. And it turns out then that yes, we can indeed establish for a class of unmodeled dynamics, which are significant, which actually look like in the, in the, in the form that, that is mentioned here, that you can get global boundedness and by introducing projection into the adaptive systems and have uh, the tracking performance actually be reasonable for a reasonable amount of time delays that are realistically present and, and uh, model dynamics that are realistically present. So what this says is that these are the processes by which you can actually carry out adaptation. And so um, uh, let me then uh, talk to you about what exactly is the kind of, of um, uh, imperfect learning goals that we can realize and which have actually been implemented in practice. So let's me walk you through a specific example which corresponds to uh, a blended wing body vehicle. And let's say that you have a certain angle of attack and um, under normal circumstances, if you uh, put in the value theta equals theta one in your controller, everything works and you are indeed able to uh, have your angle of attack follow this desired profile. But there are some instabilities that, that occurred and basically that then introduces um, a perturbation in the desired performance for the same parameter. And so essentially it's like introducing a delta parametric variation, which is unknown to you. And so for that value, basically the, the performance diverges. So you, you need to learn then what the state of star is because obviously whatever the value is that you thought you need to put in has changed. And so what adaptive control essentially does is it try, while it's not guaranteeing that you will learn theta star, it basically takes us to a uh, appropriate subspace so that in this subspace, the performance is realized even though there is imperfect learning. And so this is basically the uh, process that has been utilized in order to design these adaptive control systems. And therefore here you can see that in the, when you return it back into the uh, 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 safety critical systems, what you have is that um, uh, it, it's a, you have a class of model-based methods that determine an online solution and it can integrate with all of the cyber components as well as with human decision-making that guarantees the kinds of performance metrics that we are looking for. And this is basically what was uh, done in some of these flight, flight platforms and all of the ones that are indicated uh, with a blue star are the ones where there have been actual flight tests. So you can see, especially in the last decade that there have been any number of demonstrations which all correspond to unmanned applications where there's been improved performance and reliability. So this then tells you that this is the kind of learning that one can accomplish in the context of adaptive control. Going forward uh, uh, to, to machine learning, again, uh, you know, the entire scientific community has been taken by storm by this methodologies with very compelling successes in, the, uh, in, in a whole class of problems. And the whole idea here is essentially that you want the machine, the computer to learn using online data. And there's been a significant success in image and speech and text recognitions and, and, and games. And so the idea is you have a very complex environment, it's very difficult to model, data is of different kinds and computational complexity is enormous. And so how do you then determine an approach? And again, this is an ocean and, and what I'm going to talk about is but a drop. And my main focus here is only to um, uh, uh, cal carve out uh, two specific methodologies that basically are the ones that come closest to what we are interested in in the context of systems and control so that we can uh, basically um, uh, uh, figure out what the fundamental tenets are that we can um, import and integrate into for online decision making for the kinds of problems that we are interested in. And in this context, basically, there are two things that I thought are relevant, which is that the underlying tool that is used in many of these um, uh, machine learning components is the approximation of a nonlinear mapping. 
And typically neural networks are used to do that. And the other is that uh, you can use the notion of reinforcement learning for optimizing a cost function. And both of these approaches uh, are uh, relevant and intersect with the kinds of things that we want to do. Very quick uh, uh, chronology here. Uh, uh, the state too has a, a history that is just as long as, uh, as adaptive control. And basically in the 70s, um, uh, there was a seminal uh, uh, work by Marvin Minsky and Samuel Papert that basically said that there are certain nonlinear maps that you could simply not approximate using linear perceptrons and one therefore needed this multi-layered perceptrons. Uh, and so this led to a resurgence in the 80s where a whole bunch of us basically uh, talked about what the fundamentals are for the using neural networks for nonlinear dynamic systems. And in, in fact, it came back now, it has come back in the 21st century in a way because, and with a re resurgence, if you will, mainly because of GPUs and the enormous power that uh, basically allow us to implement many of these multi-layered perceptrons and get useful results. So the fundamental here is basically that when you have a nonlinear map, neural networks basically generate, um, uh, have a set of basis functions, which are in the form of activation functions. And by speaking, taking specific combinations of using these basis functions, by using both linear parameter regression as well as nonlinear regression, one can indeed approximate a nonlinear map. And the universal approximation theorem basically says that for there exists a bunch of layers, and the more the number of layers, the deeper the learning, hence the moniker deep learning for, for, for some, of, some of these uh, structures that says that for a certain number of layers and a certain number of weights and a certain number of uh, 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 the, the specific values of neurons, indeed, you can make the approximation in an arbitrarily small. And the idea here, again, is to use a recursive methodology for updating the weights, which is the training using backpropagation. And so there is this past loss function that you construct very similar to what we had talked about. And you adjust the parameters using this gradient descent uh, uh, rule. And, and the, uh, I would uh, refer you to this excellent uh, uh, survey paper by Sasha Fradkoff that talks about the evolution of results um, uh, in, the, in, the, in this context in here. So there were, um, uh, started with Vidro and Yakubovich. They talked about this discrete algorithms and the notion of Bregman divergence, uh, again, was used in order to in, uh, come up with analytical constructs that provide guarantees for the convergence of, of uh, these weights to uh, uh, the uh, approximation error uh, to zero. And uh, the stochastic gradient method, again, uh, lays the foundation for uh, these guarantees. And so um, now with, with these kinds of, uh, so that's one. On the other side, the second one is the notion of reinforcement learning, which again has uh, uh, the, the underpinnings and the strong connections to optimal control and dynamic programming. So the interest here is that you have an environment and you're trying to determine an agent environment is our plant and your agent is the controller. And so now we have a stochastic represent a formulation of the problem where you have a Markov decision process that models the environment. And you're interested in, again, some sort of a value function that you're maximizing, just like you you know, you can think of this as a negative value uh, of uh, the cost that you were talking about. So you then, and this is not only maximizing the reward because of the actions that you take until now, but for the future. But if you were to continue to um, proceed in this direction, what is the value function that you, you would have? And I need to take those actions that maximizes this. So then what you want to do is to figure out how this policy can be determined. And, and a Q function allows tractability of the problem formulation that says that for, here are uh, ways in which you want to design your policy. And so now that the goal is that you want to uh, uh, maximize this Q function, and given that now, if you, you have an uh, a, a infinite state space in an analog context, it becomes an intractable problem. And so in order to make it tractable, you move from the function space to Euclidean space by parameterizing it using uh, a, 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 a parameter vector theta. And if it's a linear regression problem, which was many times you can basically pose it as one, then it turns out that you can actually come up with an analytical guarantee. And so here too, you basically un estimate the unknown parameters using this iterative algorithm. And this and countless variations of, this is not tried to be in any way an exhaustive summary of everything that's happening in this world, but it gives you a snapshot of the kinds of things that 
um, we can, uh, again, look at which intersect. And so here are some examples that show that, yes, you can use uh, reinforcement learning in order to tackle challenging problem and in robotics and in any number of uh, uh, games with AlphaGo and, and uh, DeepMind, et cetera, that tells you that here is a tractable way in which you can actually demonstrate what these things can do. Now, returning to what we are interested in, which is really the control of safety critical systems, remember that this is what we were talking about and that the, the performance metrics needed to be even more stringent of the order, order of 10 to the minus 8%. Um, let's talk about what the numbers of the successes that we have. And so these new approaches are uh, basically that, uh, you know, in the context of, for example, if you were to take the image recognition, the kinds of, of numbers that are reported to date are something of the order of 85%, say, for instance. Now, that is, there is a significant gap between that and 10 to the minus 8, which is what we are talking about here, right, in the context of autonomous transportation systems. So it's not adequate, and there is a huge gap that we need to bridge. And so the question is, can we uh, uh, figure out ways in which you can combine these two methods? And that basically is, is the rest of the talk here. So again, I've, you might have already seen that there are lots of commonalities between the approach, two approaches and the core of it. And, and so let me just point to what they are and then um, want to some interesting ways in which you can combine these two methods. The first is basically the underlying approach for adjusting the parameter. So there is a notion of a recursive update of a parameter. And, and this basically uh, takes the form of this gradient descent. And, and it turns out that whether you have a linear regression or you have some latency between the parameter error and performance error, there are this similar kinds of gradient descent that you can employ. And the same idea has been utilized uh, significantly in the context of uh, machine learning as well. There are a number of references here where it's there is a loss function and you basically use an update rule that is very similar to the gradient descent. So here's uh, basically commonality one. The second is the use of projection. And quite often in order to really make sure that you have this, this right trade-off between performance and learning, you basically constrain the space within which you're learning because you have prior information. And that basically gives you an enormous tractability and, and especially when it comes to robustness, which we, we utilized again and again in all of the, uh, the results that I shared with you. And so, um, uh, interestingly enough, the same projection method has also been looked at in many of the, rough, uh, the uh, methods that in the machine learning literature, and the idea is very similar, and you use some kind of uh, regularization to make sure that this, this lear learning indeed occurs in an efficient manner. The next is the speed, acceleration of learning. How fast can you learn? How fast can you bring the parameters to, to zero, uh, parameter errors to zero? And here, um, uh, again, we've uh, looked at several you know, methodologies, integral algorithms, recursively squares, updates, and all of which basically have tried to figure out ways in which you can learn quickly. And again, for tractability reasons, you need to introduce the notion of a forgetting factor, but it can be done. And same, very similar ideas, Adagrad and Adam, for instance, are two approaches that have been uh, proposed that have to do with a time varying learning rate. And, sparsifying the gradients, normalizing through gradients, regularization are all tools that have been utilized before introducing time varying uh, adaptive gains. And that yeah, is a yet another similarity. So there I can go on, the list is endless, but now let's, okay, so now that we have two different methodologies that are um, uh, uh, have basically been attempting to do the same thing, which is online decision and control, and there are these uh, problem statements and tools that seem to be very similar, are there ways in which we can actually combine them? And I want to basically close this talk out with three examples where uh, uh, these kinds of combinations have led to, uh, can lead to interesting solutions. And the first one is a notion of a high order tuner. And so let me start with, again, our, the linear regression problem. And so in this particular case, the loss function is essentially quadratic in the, uh, in the parameter. And as I pointed out, this gradient descent basically says that I'm going to use the, the gradient of L as well as the regressor that is driving the process. And I really need to introduce a normalization in here. And it turns out that this is essential for discrete time systems in order to make sure that the system is well behaved. 
And, and so this gradient descent then with this normalization gives us a way of minimizing the loss. But notice that whether it's the normalized or otherwise, these are first order tuners. And so the question is, is it really necessary to you? Is there a way in which we can accelerate the whole process of minimizing the loss using high order tuners? And that basically is um, uh, the first method that we can adopt, propose in here, which combines these two methodologies. And this basically says that, yes, you use the gradient information, but you actually introduce a momentum term in here. And that gives you a much, uh, gives you this high order tuner. And so uh, what is nice about it is that indeed you can show that all of the solutions are globally bounded. And here is a, in, the Lyapunov function, which actually is very, very similar to what we had before, but now it's in the form of a high order tuner. And uh, it, you can take the same thing uh, even uh, for towards discrete time. And here is where some more interesting uh, components come into the picture, which is that this is not a just a straightforward discretization. You cannot do symplectic discretization because then you preserve the properties of what you have in continuous time in terms of accelerated performance. Um, but it turns out that there is an interesting combination of explicit Euler and implicit Euler and an extra gradient that gives you what you're looking for in discrete time. And, and what that tells you is that once again, you get global boundedness with this particular Lyapunov function. And it should be noted that this is not what is done, for instance, in any of the neural networks. So this is basically a totally different way of looking at the problem. Now, why is this so important and different? And uh, how does it compare with what's happening in, in uh, the current kind of uh, machine learning algorithms that propose accelerated learning? The, there are two things to point out in here. The first thing is that the regressor that is used in order to really carry out the, the training basically assumes that they're not really changing with time. They're not adversarial, they're not time varying. That, but that never happens in, in a dy dynamic system, especially one that is riddled with uncertainties because of sudden and abrupt and unknown changes that you couldn't anticipate for during training. So what this says is that even when you have these time varying regressors, everything works fine. And the second has to do with the speed at with which these things, these things uh, work. So why are these high order tuners even useful? They're useful because of the following. So they all guarantee convergence to zero, fine. But then let's take a little bit closer uh, look at how fast do they converge? And you can actually show that the gradient descent is actually something of the order of one over epsilon, that epsilon is the error. So let's say, for instance, you have a million uh, iterations, which corresponds to one over epsilon. What these high order to tools, and this is what was proposed by Nestroff, do is basically to reduce it to square root of epsilon, which means that from a million iterations, you actually go to a thousand, which is much, much faster. And the high order tuner that we proposed in the earlier slide basically says that you're just but a log factor away from this nest drop. It says that compared to gradient descent, you have a much faster convergence to zero, which is basically enormously important if you're trying to deal with ways in which you can maintain, you can get very good performance and then go on to learning the parametric uncertainties. And so that basically is the benefit of uh, these high order tuners. So let me just uh, give you a couple of examples. So here is a, a, a benchmark problem in, in uh, uh, machine learning control that's uh, known as a smooth hard problem. And so we, we basically consider a variation of that where essentially the regressor that is, is the cause for the, the loss function changes suddenly. And so here is uh, the left hand, left hand side where we have the high order tuner and in compare, compared with a whole bunch of, of existing algorithms, both in the adaptive literature as well as in the machine learning literature. And you can see that when this uh, regressor changes suddenly, you no longer have uh, uh, a well-behaved behavior for anything other than normalized gradient descent, which is the reason for introducing the normalization and the high order tuner. And in fact, even when our changes is more benign, you can see the same kind of improvement in performance. So here, here's point score number one for the high order tuner. And uh, let me also walk you very quickly through a deep blurring problem. And again, uh, I will let you go through these slides at your leisure to figure out uh, all the details of how the deep blurring problem is set up. But the whole idea here is that you have an image and there are there is blurring that is introduced and that basically is the uncertainty in here. You're trying to reconstruct the original image. In other words, you're trying to minimize this loss. 
we consider a particular problem basically where this blur changes um, uh, suddenly unbeknownst to, to us. And, um, and so in fact, we used a, 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 a smooth va a variation of, of this uh, regressor that is driving the process. And we assume that this change occurs basically very uh, over 200 uh, iterations. And what we saw was that compared to, again, the benchmark methods, the high order tuners is able to give us a, a much, much uh, better uh, uh, performance errors than, than what happens with the Nestrop. The Nestrop simply is not able to do, do that. So here is basically a video to walk you through this. The central two algorithms are the ones that are the uh, benchmark ones. And what you see on the right side is what the high order tuner is, is able to do. And so what this says is that the high order tuner basically is able to guarantee um, uh, that the system is well behaved even when the regressors are varying with time and it basically gives you a fast convergence. You can actually take this idea and extend it to not just everything that I showed you so far is where the loss function was quadratic, uh, which certainly is convex, but we can take this to general convex functions and show that even in this case, the, the underlying properties are still valid. And so here is one where the, the loss, you can show that this is a convex function and with a unique minima. And so uh, the uh, approaches again, as before, other than the high order tuner are not able to cope with these uh, changes. And so from right to left, what we have done is basically to look at a, several numerical exercises where the change in the, in the underlying regressor is, is smaller and smaller. And here is where everything is a constant. And you can see that both the algorithms basically give you the same kind of, kind of performance. And so uh, uh, this, the summary here is basically then that this high order tuner, which is a combination of the methods in the machine learning literature and the adaptive literature gives you the right combination between stability in the case of time varying regressor and fast convergence in the case of constant uh, regressors. So that's point number one. So the point number two is um, accelerated learning, because everything that I talked about had nothing to do with how quickly the parameters converge to the uh, error converges to zero. And remember, I talked to you about the ways in which you can introduce a, a time varying learning rate, like recursive least squares, um, and, and get this exponential convergence. Now, what we would like to do is to not really do any kind of resets with the covariance and the forgetting factor, because all of those are manual and it basically introduces discontinuity and it basically requires um, uh, some sort of a empirical reset, which we would like to avoid and automate the whole problem. Now, when you have persistent excitation, and this is something that is a necessary and sufficient condition, which is the same thing as you know having spectral uh, lines, uh, sufficient number of spectral lines, then it, uh, you, you parameter error converges to zero. So what we have introduced in here is this time varying gain, and this time varying gain basically gives us accelerated convergence. But, but let's not go into continuous time, let's stay with discrete time, and here is the algorithm that says that yes, you can do this. And so there is no reset here. There is no forgetting factor in here. But what we can guarantee is that this learning rate has this right trade-off between speed and stability. And because we can guarantee that it always automatically um, stays between two bounds, you don't need a reset to keep it move away from zero. And you, you don't need to um, introduce projections in order to make sure that it doesn't run away. If you have persistent excitation, then it turns out that you can indeed make the system well behaved. And again, when you compare it with um, uh, the, so some of the benchmark methods, such as Adagrad, um, when you have time varying regressors, we can show that the loss function is well behaved, just like I showed you earlier, but also that the parameters can be learned. So this says that here is a way in which you can actually get accelerated learning in addition to accelerated performance. And the last thing that I'd like to do and take uh, five minutes, uh, the, my last five minutes to do this is to move towards real-time machine learning by using a combination of adaptive control and reinforcement learning. So again, if you recall, um, reinforcement learning is a methodology that basically is motivated by coming up with an as a optimization of a cost function. It's an offline approach. And it's basically a training and simulation approach. And the analytical guarantees are when the action and state sets are finite. Adaptive control, on the other hand, is online. 
and it it solves it's, it doesn't look at it from an optimal control point of view but basically in minimizing the performance error to zero the solution is in real time it's online and it basically does not require the finite state state assumption and so now can we then uh, 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 look at these two and see given that indeed this is a methodology that you can learn in online can we then propose a solution that combines the best of both of these methods? And that basically is what we are proposing as the ACRL solution in here. So the idea here is that you have a, a true system. This is your, your true, true model in here. Now the true model basically, uh, in order to really make the, in the context of the standard reinforcement learning, assumes that the in simulation, you can repeat the process and collect data and have a policy and have that policy be updated. So let me use the mono, uh, subscript R to introduce all of those things. So that's like a reference system. However, that reference system is something that is idealized and the true system is not going to be the same, right? So what if you were to introduce an addition based on adaptive control such that indeed you can in closed loop have an inner loop design in here so that this basically approximates the, the reference model that was utilized in order to make the uh, reinforcement le learning work. In other words, there is an outer loop that basically is providing the corrective action so that in long term, you have the optimization that you're looking for, so that if indeed there is no parametric uncertainty, everything will work. And what the adaptive controller is trying to do is to basically make sure that the inner loop, the system basically looks exactly like the reference model. That basically is a, is a combination of both of these worlds. And it turns out that this can be done. And so the problem, again, let me illustrate that by uh, in the context of this uh, fairly um, uh, difficult task of autonomous landing of a quadrotor on a moving platform. And the uh, premise here is that there are all kinds of parametric uncertainties. There's a loss of effectiveness and success is sort of not really in an ISX transpose QX kind of a thing, but something that is really mission specific. So it, it makes sense that in this context, we have these kinds of numbers. And so any time the quadrotor crashes or it does not complete the time in, an, in the specified time, we consider it as a, as a failure. So you want to maximize the success rate, right? And actually the quadrotor problem when subjected to parametric uncertainty is something that we did more than a decade ago. And here is basically the uh, example that uh, says, what we assumed was that the propeller basically suddenly loses thrust. And uh, it was an LQR controller in loop, and that really did not do the job. Whereas the adaptive controller, basically, even when this thrust is lost, uh, which is basically a piece of the propeller blade that you saw the fly out, it, uh, it provides the right compensation. So we, we then were inspired by this, this example to basically carry out these numerical ex, uh, experiment where now we have upped our uh, uh, objective. It's not just a hover, but it has to land on this moving platform. And we compared the um, proposed uh, ACRL um, uh, structure with a pure RL. And as you, and we increase the loss of effectiveness, basically this thrust that is lost um, in, the, in one of the motors. And you can see that there is a huge improvement in, in the success rate as was quantified in here. And you will see that in this particular uh, uh, video, um, there's a 50% loss of uh, effectiveness mid-flight, and basically the, um, uh, this, the quadrotor crashes, whereas the adaptive controller, and this is not really shown in real time, we have slowed it down in order to have the video play out cleanly, uh, it does much better. Now, you can indeed uh, try, and so the question is, hey, you know, we didn't know, and so you introduced a new experiment where, where which was not trained for, so there are ways in which you can actually make your uh, reinforcement learning be trained through additional um, uh, ones which try to uh, randomize the domain. But you can see that even with this kind of a thing, uh, we are able to have a, 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 a much faster performance uh, with, much, uh, with, with higher success rate without any of the additional training or computational effort. And so uh, that basically is the, the kind of improvement that we can get by introducing these adaptive controllers in the inner loop and have the reinforcement learning, which basically does the anticipatory and trajectory generation task um, uh, through, through training and simulation. So why is it successful? Well, the main reason is that basically you could not anticipate a offline during training these kinds of methods. So you can see that 
uh, in this particular case, um, what really happened was that the reinforcement learning had a different model and was just simply not able to predict as to what the correct policy needs to be. And it is this uh, difference that makes the, the uh, ACRL, which is in blue, do better than the one that's pure auto, which is in, in, in red. And so if you were to look under the hood a little bit more, there's those uh, time varying adaptive control gains are the ones that provide the right corrective action online. So you can see that everything starts with zero. And essentially what this is saying is that this is the direction in which the gains have to be adjusted in order to make the performance error to go to zero. And when you have that loss of effectiveness, for instance, that this uh, adaptive controller basically provides this additional thrust and here is the kind of um, uh, controls, uh, uh, thrust uh, actions that are needed in order to realize that the, um, uh, you have a successful combination of ACR. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I walked you through sort of a historical um, story of how adaptive control talks about learning and how it really addresses this fine line, the fact that learning and performance are duals of each other in the right way with a stability framework that even with imperfect uh, learning, you can guarantee uh, that the performance is indeed what you're looking for. And learning happens with persistent excitation afterwards. And so uh, in comparison, um, uh, we went through some of the, the basic tools that are in machine learning that gives us a uh, way in which you can deal with complex dynamic systems by learning a, um, a nonlinearity and by um, in introducing pure learning, which can give you a guarantee when you have finite uh, state action sets. And we were able to combine these methodologies and really move towards accelerated performance, move towards accelerated learning and move towards real time machine learning. So I would like to just end with a few takeaways in here. You know, learning as a concept, uh, as a methodology, is something that in a dynamic context, really, we have to keep in mind. It occurs at multiple time scales. And so when you have a safety critical system where time is of the essence, whether you do learning for control or control for learning is something that one ought to think about and really pay attention to. And it, uh, in, in a safety critical system, you really need to adapt first and then do learning that guarantees with imperfect learning are essential. So this is the main point here that I think we need to uh, keep in mind as we move towards fully autonomous systems that you really need these guarantees that allow you to make real time decisions where some of these uncertainties are not things that you can anticipate during training and simulation, but really things that have to be addressed on the fly in real time online. And for that, you need to combine some of these adaptive methods uh, with machine learning and really look at control for learning in addition to learning for control, which has been looked at uh, elsewhere. So for decision making under fast time scales, some of these methodologies might be essential. Thank you very much.